morning. Good morning and welcome. Uh, sorry to be a little bit late. These are uh, they're busy days, and you are busy too. And it's wonderful, wonderful uh, to uh, have you all with us uh, today. And we thank you. It's about uh, speaking about a very, very serious and critical issue that is uh, facing our uh, our country and our families uh, today. So we are uh, really delighted that you've agreed to uh, to be with us. Um, uh, we all want to. Um, uh, 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 my name is Rosa Deloro. I am a co-chair along with Congresswoman Barbara Lee and uh, Congressman Eric Swalwell of the Steering and Policy Committee. I'll introduce our, 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 our colleagues, uh, other colleagues in a moment. Um, but th th the auspices, uh, the Steering and Policy Committee is the auspices under which um, the hearing is being held uh, this morning. And I know that we all want to say a thank you to the speaker. Um, and she will not be with us this morning, but she regards this as critically important. Uh, so uh, my colleagues as well, um, uh, will, uh, Raul Grijalva and Betty McCollum uh, will sit, make a few opening remarks as well. Uh, after 25 days, the president continues to hold the country hostage with his shutdown. Uh, he has manufactured a crisis at the border that has no basis in fact and used the wall to incite fear. In the process, he is hurting families who live paycheck to paycheck, forcing workers to live with unimaginable insecurity, and as a consequence, is also damaging our natural landscapes. And all this from someone who took an oath to preserve, protect, and defend. There's a failures on all counts, if I might add. And today, we are specifically highlighting impacts that relate to our national parks and our public lands, as well as our indigenous communities. Our first panel is about indigenous communities who rely on the federal government for vital essential services, including matters of law and justice and life and death. They are suffering because of the president's shutdown. Native American tribes, which rely heavily on federal money to operate, the shutdown can cripple, cripple their most basic functions. Services like tribal courts and law enforcement are disrupted. Most Indian health centers, which are federally funded like the VA, will soon need to cancel programs or cease offering services. Food assistance programs, on which 93,000 tribal members in 276 tribes depend, may run out of funding by the end of the month. Meanwhile, tribes are having to drain their accounts to cover related unexpected expenses. The Salt Tribe of Chippewa Indians is paying $100,000 per day to keep health clinics and food pantries fully functional. I view it as cruel cruel and unnecessary. And today we have gathered experts who will further detail what this shutdown looks like on the ground. Second panel will overview the impacts of the Trump shutdown on our national parks and our public lands. In short, they are in a state of disrepair. Um, we have uh, uh, parks, wildlife refuges, public lands operating with skeleton crews, uh, putting at risk the parks, the lands, and the guests that arrive. There have been reports of extensive damage to sensitive historical, cultural, and natural resources on our nation's public lands. So it is time for the president to stop holding the American people hostage. And we urge our colleagues uh, to, on the other side of the aisle, to heed the harms that we will be discussing today. Help us to open the government, indigenous communities, federal workers, and families across the country cannot keep waiting. And with that, I would like to turn the microphone over to uh, uh, our colleague from California, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Thank you very much. Uh, first, thank you, uh, Congresswoman DeLauro and Eric Swallow for your uh, tremendous leadership on, on this uh, steering and policy committee. It's really uh, wonderful to be working with both of you on so many important issues uh, that we're faced with today. Uh, also, in her absence to uh, Speaker Pelosi, uh, not only uh, must we uh, applaud her continuing leadership uh, addressing and highlighting this administration's reckless and damaging shutdown, but she's working so hard with all of us to open the government uh, right away, immediately. So 
thank all of you uh, for being here also. We look forward to your testimony. We're here today um, to discuss the impacts of the Trump administration's irresponsible and frankly, um, their reckless shutdown on our nation's public lands and Indian country. Now, as a member of the Appropriations Committee, uh, I know how important it is to ensure that our nation's public lands are open to all families. Every day, this shutdown drags on uh, our historical, cultural, and natural resources in our public lands are feeling the impacts. And the situation is simply unacceptable in our national parks. 16,000 Park Service employees are not working. Uh, that's 16,000 individuals with families, with children, with uh, bills to pay who deserve their paychecks. On top of that, uh, the shutdown is having a ripple effect across communities. The National Park Service is losing $400,000 a day for a total of $5 million to date. All the while, uncollected garbage is piling up and facilities go unmaintained. And what's worse, the Trump administration has decided to keep some parks open, leaving visitors' safety at grave risk. In Yosemite, for example, a hiker died from a fall after chasing his dog along a trail. The Washington Post reported that seven people have died in our national parks since the shutdown. People's lives are at risk. These closings are impacting every district in our nation. Near my own district, for example, in the beautiful Bay Area Muir Woods, we had to close uh, last week. That's impacting more than 3,000 visitors who visit the park daily. That's a loss to tourism and our economy. In addition to wreaking havoc on federal workers' lives, their families and their livelihoods, the Trump administration is hurting millions of American Indians. Daily life has been interrupted, including health care services, food programs, and general maintenance of tribal lands. This is really a slap in the face to these families. Up to 100,000 tribal members rely on food assistance as well. With this Trump shutdown, they may run out of funding by the end of this month. Let me be clear. If President Trump doesn't end this shutdown, families will go hungry. This president isn't just holding our government hostage. He's endangering people's health care, their food, and their basic safety. It's unconscionable. And so I'm pleased to be here today with our, of course, committee chairs uh, to discuss this at length. And I look forward to hearing from our panelists. And I just want to thank all of the members who are participating today on this very important hearing. Thank you. Eric. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman DeLauro, uh, Chairwoman Lee, and also uh, Chairman Grijalva uh, for uh, convening this. This is the first hearing uh, in the 116th Congress uh, on uh, the shutdown. Uh, and, you know, the President may proudly own the shutdown by his own words, uh, but the pain of the shutdown uh, is owned uh, by the people that you represent. Uh, whether it's uh, an Indian country in places uh, like the Kickapoo tribe in Kansas where 22 uh, employees have already been laid off or with the Colvilles tribes uh, that have lost $400,000 each week uh, that this shutdown uh, has persisted. And, and I would just ask, I think it would be most helpful today uh, in your testimony if you really, uh, you know, gave the narrative uh, in, in color uh, to the individuals who are affected by that. I think that uh, really has helped uh, make sure that the American people understand that this is a, a shutdown the president wanted, a shutdown that Democrats are seeking to end, but a shutdown, most importantly, that is not about the president. It's about the people who are affected. Uh, I, I just want to also bring attention, uh, Congressman Lee brought this up, uh, John Muir. In 1838, he wrote a letter to his sister that said, the mountains are calling and I must go. And we are here today to make sure that when those mountains call, they are open so we may answer. Our public lands and national parks are national treasures. People come from across the world to hike, camp, and enjoy our forests, beaches, and mountains. Us Californians, we pride our si ourselves on having easy access to awe-inspiring places such as Yosemite, Joshua Tree, Golden Gate National Park, Muir Woods, and Death Valley. And as John Muir also said, keep close to nature's heart and break clear away once in a while and climb a mountain or spend a week in the woods. 
Wash your spirit clean. Donald Trump's self-owned shutdown has caused Americans and visitors from other countries to not be able to explore our great outdoors. 25 days ago, approximately 800,000 federal workers, including our park rangers, were told that they cannot show up to work or must continue to work without pay. These precious lands have trash cans that are piling up and visitor restrooms that are overflowing with garbage and waste. State and local governments are using funds that they don't have to try and mitigate this issue. That will not continue. With limited or no staff, our cultural and historical lands are highly vulnerable to vandalism and irreversible damage. The mountains are calling. I hope the shutdown ends soon. Thank you for your insights on how the Trump shutdown is hurting Indian country and our public lands and livelihood. And I yield back. Thank you. Now I'd like to um, uh, introduce for comments uh, the chair of the Natural Resources uh, uh, Committee of the House, and that is our colleague Raul Grijalva. Chairwoman DeLauro, uh, thank you very much for uh, convening this first hearing. Uh, it's an important hearing, and I want to thank all our witnesses for uh, attending. I appreciate it very much. The notice wasn't – didn't give you a lot of time, so I appreciate you being here. Uh, yeah, this now somebody mentioned, and uh, I associate myself with the comments that uh, the previous speakers, uh, including the chair, have made. And uh, while it's a uh, it's a fad to be redundant in politics, I'll try to avoid it, because much of what was stated is the purpose of this hearing, uh, to look at those impacts, and to look at sometimes at areas in which, uh, in, in the past, were considered collateral damage. Well, we had a ch shutdown, the park suffered. Oh, we had a sh shutdown, and the, w and the worst affected by that shutdown was Indian country and indigenous people in this country that they received the least, even, e even during the previous one. And so my point today is to highlight the humanity of what we're talking about, H highlight also as well uh, our parks and public lands. Uh, a treasure, jeopardized as it is right now, a treasure nevertheless, and something that we need to defend. And this shutdown, going on 25 days, now 25 days, a record, uh, has done irreparable, has done harm uh, to the public lands. And those mentioned the vandalism, the looting, the trashing of the public lands. Uh, and, and in Indian country, once again, you see that those in the most vulnerable positions are the ones that almost immediately feel the negative effect. Uh, these are two jurisdictions of this uh, Congress, and as we go forward, uh, uh, I think it's important to note that we are in this situation not because it had to happen, we have to have a shutdown, not because it was unavoidable, because there was many opportunities to avoid the shutdown. We're here because of uh, uh, the ego and the almost blind obsession to a monstrous wall by one individual, and that's Trump. And that obsession has led us to this paralysis and the failure of leadership on the part of the Senate and their majority leader to bring this to a closure. And so we're here today to emphasize what is going on in America. I appreciate it, Chairwoman, that these two areas are highlighted today in your hearing. Uh, I look forward to the testimony. And, and we're talking about a wall that is a monument to bigotry, a monument to inefficiency, a monument to that something that will not work, and most of all, uh, it is uh, it is jeopardizing everything else that we care about. And so, uh, I want to thank you and uh, yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Congresswoman Betty McCollum, who will be is the at the moment the chair designate of the Interior Subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'd like to join my colleagues in welcoming the witnesses. You each have unique insights which will help us better understand the harmful effects of the Trump shutdown. Today has been pointed out as the 25th day of the, sh the shutdown and the damage it afflicts, particularly threatening the life, health, and safety of our Native American brothers and sisters. Because once again, we have failed to meet our treaty responsibilities to our tribal nations. Basic services like health care, tribal justice services, food assistance for seniors are putting nearly 
1.9 million Americans throughout Indian country at great risk. Things like stripping tribal nations from funds that support entire communities. And let me just mention a few of those impacts. How about school lunches for children, tribal housing programs for families, health care and social services for seniors being stopped in some cases or going to be stopped shortly if this shutdown doesn't come to an end. Native American Lifelines is an example of a health care program that's under contract with the Indian Health Services, and these clinics focus on health care for the needy and the elderly. These clinics have been forced to close. So, Ms. Hawk-Lassard, your patients, tribal nations in our country deserve better than treating patients as pawns to be sacrificed. The Trump shutdowns also placing our national parks, our crown jewels, under threat. This administration continues to allow visitors to enter as if everything is normal at our national parks. Well, it's not. The Park Service does not have the funding to ensure visitor safety and address the most basic standard needs of cleanliness to protect our park assets. The Department of Interior has announced an illegal plan to force parks to start redirecting funds from entry fees. Those fees are clearly designated for capital improvement projects and now they're going to be used to clean toilets. This is no substitute for the park's annual operating budget of $2.5 billion. The National Parks Conservation Association is alarmed, and they've asked the Inspector General to investigate the Interior's decision, and I quote, to leave the U.S. National Park System open during an ongoing lapse of appropriation with, staff, with levels of staffing and service that are grossly inadequate to protect the parks and their visitors. Lasting damage is being done. It's time to reopen the government. On Friday, the House passed H.R. 226, which had provided critical funding to open DOI, EPA, and Indian Health Services. Senate Republicans have a choice. Take up this bill and open up the government or reject it and leave the government closed. President Trump and Senate Republicans must stop holding the American people hostage, especially when it comes to life, health, and safety. And Madam Chair, I thank you for uh, putting this together as the fact that our full committees have not organized yet. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, before we get to the introduction of our, our experts and our guests here this morning, let me introduce the uh, members of the House of Representatives. Her mic isn't on. Rosa, your mic. Keep. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, the, the members who are here, and I, we all thank them for their interest, their concern. Uh, and their their work on, on, on behalf of uh, families in this country and their interest in uh, uh, the the issues of our of our uh, uh, parks and the issues of our indigenous communities. Robin Kelly of Illinois, uh, Ms. Underwood of uh, Illinois as well, uh, Congresswoman Chu of California, um, uh, Congressman Pallone, who is a chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, in the House of Representatives uh, from New Jersey, Congresswoman Annie Custer, uh, who is from New Hampshire. Uh, and, okay, I think I... And Deb, I'm sorry, Deb, you're right there. Deb Holland, uh, uh, and I might add, she'll tell you, she's the first Native American woman to sit in the House of Representatives. <laughs> Woo! All right. Sounds good, thank you. Uh, sorry, Deb, um, and um, from New Mexico. So, uh, and with that, we will uh, we begin the introductions and then really listen to your uh, your words. Uh, we have with us this morning uh, Carrie Hawk uh, Lassard, a member of the Shawnee Tribe and the Executive Director, Native American Lifelines. Since 2000, the 501c3 nonprofit supports the health needs of urban Indians in the Baltimore, Maryland metropolitan area. Next, uh, we have Mary Green Trottier. Great. Thank you very much. She is uh, a member of the Spirit Lake Nation, serves as president also of the National Association of Food Distribution Programs on Indian Reservations Board. And as we know, the Trump shutdown, of course, has put food programs on which 47 million Americans rely at risk. This includes food on those Indian reservations. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Dr. Aaron Payment, chairman of Sioux St. Marie Tribe and board member also at National Congress of American Indians. Uh, and he has been in the second term as chairperson uh, of the tribe 
Uh, with 42,000 members, his tribe is the largest east of the Mississippi and has served as a tribal council member, vice cha chairperson, and now in his second four-year term as chairperson. We will also introduce at this time the second panel so that we can just uh, uh, keep the, uh, the narrative flowing. Uh, Dan Ash, who is uh, president and CEO of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. How wonderful. God, <laughs> Sue said, what could be better, right? That's a fun job. It's a fun job. Um, it's a great place for grandkids, right? You got it all, right? <laughs> We're all... Uh, 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 Dan was director of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service from February 2011 to January 2017, and before that was here as professional staff in the House of Representatives, so he knows about this, uh, um, this institution. Um, let me reference, uh, we have this letter uh, from uh, 81, quote, of, of friends uh, groups who sent us a letter um, uh, uh, about the issue and what the difficulties are at hand, and we'll make that part of the uh, of the, of the, the, the record. And um, they are calling on um, uh, the groups of the National Wildlife Refuge, calling on the government to be reopened. And thank you very, very much. We also have uh, John Jarvis, who is um, my constituent. Welcome, so glad to see you here. Thank you so much. Who's now executive director of the Institute for Parks, People, and Biodiversity at the University of California at Berkeley. Previously, John uh, served as National Park Service uh, for 40 years, including its 18th director. So uh, thank you again, John, for being here. Uh, it's good to see you. Finally, we have uh, Richard Ring, who's a board member of the Coalition to Save America's National Parks uh, and former superintendent of Everglades National Park uh, in Florida. Uh, Mr. Ring retired in June of 2016 from NPT's Park Projects Director position. In that position, he worked with NPT partners, supporters, and park agency representatives. He retired after 36 years of federal service, 32 of which were with the National Park Service. And uh, before we just begin with the testimony, I just call attention to an article that appeared on the 1st of January in the New York Times by Mitch Smith and Julie Turkowitz, Shut Down Lee's Food, Medicine, and Pay in Doubt in Indian Country. It really is an outstanding article that lays out uh, the serious difficulties and the, um, uh, the heartbreak um, that, is, uh, that people are suffering uh, today. And w with that, we will... Get started with our testimony, Ms. Hawk Lessard. Hatito, uh, on behalf of the National Council of Urban Indian Health, Native American Lifelines, and the many American Indian Alaska Native patients that we serve annually, I'd like to thank the Democratic Steering and Policy Committee and the House Committee on Natural Resources for this opportunity to testify on the government shutdown impacts on Indian Country. My name is Her Carrie Hawk Lessard, and I am Shawnee. I am on the board of the National Council of Urban Indian Health, and I'm the executive director of Native American Lifelines, which serves both Baltimore and Boston. Nakui represents 41 urban Indian organizations providing healthcare services pursuant to a grant or contract with the Indian Health Service under Title V of the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. Urban Indian health programs see tribal members from all 573 federally recognized tribes and urban Indians as part of the Indian health service system, which consists of IHS direct services, tribally operated facilities, and urban Indian health programs, or the ITU. UIHPs were created by Congress after the relocation era in recognition that the trust obligation for health care follows Indians off reservations and wherever they go. UIHPs are defined as outreach and referral programs, limited ambulatory programs, full ambulatory or substance abuse treatment programs. My UIHP, Native American Lifelines of Baltimore and Boston, was established to meet health, dental, and behavioral health needs of urban Indians residing in the DC, Maryland, Virginia, and Delaware area, as well as New England for our Boston program. With a direct focus on substance abuse prevention and treatment services, Lifelines also provides health promotion disease prevention activities designed to improve the health status of the community, as well as case management services that facilitate and coordinate access to much needed care. Lifelines is the only Title V urban Indian health program providing services to Indian people in these areas. 
As an outreach and referral program, Lifelines is tasked with linking American Indians to care primarily because there are no urban ambulatory clinics on the East Coast. Um, a sizable number of our user population constitutes of tribal citizens working for the federal government or IHS employees in Rockville, Maryland who have access to IHS hospitals and clinics on their homelands, but not here where they are working and living. The partial government shutdown is having, high, having dire consequences for American Indian health care, including urban Indian people and urban Indian health. The federal government has an affirmative obligation to provide health care to our people. This trust responsibility stems from treaties and long-standing U.S. policy and jurisprudence. The shutdown of IHS is directly at odds with that obligation. To be clear, these impacts are being felt across the entire Indian health care delivery system. However, today I'm going to speak to you about the impacts it's having on urban Indian health care. Approximately 78% of Native people reside in urban areas, many due to government forced relocation policies or in search of economic or educational opportunities. Despite this, the urban Indian line item constitutes less than 1% of the total IHS budget. Urban Indian health programs like Lifelines thus depend on every single dollar that we receive in order to combat this systematic underfunding and we're forced to stretch resources to provide services to our patients. Anytime there is a lapse in funding or any funding is taken away from UIHPs, our facilities suffer and ultimately our Native people suffer. The impact of an IHS shutdown is that already chronically underfunded facilities are forced to make extremely difficult decisions without any other options. Facilities will not be able to provide care to patients. At Native American Lifelines, we receive less than a million dollars from IHS for two facilities in major metropolitan areas. IHS often provides late payments of allocated funds, most recently distributing funds to Lifelines in September of 2018. The money to operate our facility has effectively stopped coming in, but the patients have not stopped needing health care. We routinely receive calls requesting purchase of care funding to pay for medical care, prescriptions, and other health care services. We also provide de direct dental services to these individuals. We thus far have had to deny purchase of care requests that are critical to chronic care management, including insulin, blood pressure medication, thyroid medication, and antibiotics, thus impacting the quality of life for the individuals that we serve. We provide behavioral health services to our community that has been interrupted and the impacts are already devastating. We have had six clients overdose on opioids in the last two months and two thirds of these overdoses were fatalities. As an outreach and referral providing substance abuse counseling services and referrals to care in addition to support to our people, it's unthinkable that we will not be able to assist in a time of such great need. As our program is now effectively closed and our therapist is forced to work without pay, those struggling now have nowhere to go. Substance abuse will continue to occur and so will the overdoses. That, won't, that we won't be in place to assist is deeply troubling to me and to everyone with our organization. So we close our doors effectively on January 12th of this year as that is when funding absolutely ran out. Another program was in danger of closing today, but will be receiving community supports to remain open for a few more weeks. We are not alone in feeling these impacts. Many of the 41 UIHPs that span 22 states are struggling without adequate funds. A Nakui survey found that of 13 UIHP respondents, only five could sustain normal operations for one month or less. We are 25 days into the shutdown, and most UIHPs will not be able to stay open much longer. Several are having to resort to pause hiring, start staff layoffs, or a forced reduction in services or clinic hours, thereby significantly limiting services available to their native patients. UIHPs will then lose quality staff and have continuing snowball issues that last long after the shutdown is over and the impacts of the shutdown are real and immediate. I'd like to share real numbers with you to better illustrate how underfunded we are. I wanna highlight that we receive $922,000 for two clinics. Out of that funding, IHS gives us 
$691 for mental health for both facilities. You heard me correctly, $691 for Baltimore and Boston. That is not enough to take care of any one of our patients. Furthermore, UIHPs only receive money from one IHS line item, Urban Indian Health. No facilities or hospital money, no purchased and referred care, nothing. This only averages to about $700 per patient that we receive from IHS, even though per capita health expenditures for the U.S. are almost $10,000. As a Native veteran patient once said, it is still legal for the federal government to kill Indians, even in 2019. The only true way to resolve this is to restore funding to IHS and provide adequate funding to take care of our people. It is incumbent on the federal government to fund the Indian health system and provide health services to Native people as obligated under its trust responsibility. Congressional leaders must work together to restore funding to IHS by passing a budget or exempting IHS funds from government shutdowns. The lives of Native people should not be put at risk due to disagreements over unrelated budget proposals. IHS must receive advanced and mandatory appropriations similar to the VA, which also serves a population that critically needs health care access to redu reduce significant disparities. My grandpa died waiting for care at the VA. We didn't hear from the VA until two months after he walked on that they could finally serve him for his Alzheimer's. Indians, and especially our Native veterans, shouldn't be treated with such subpar care. The need to rely on such relatively small levels of funding is extremely difficult for health facilities, and the constant delays and uncertainties stemming from the current appropriations process results in inefficiencies and the utter inability for long-term planning, something that's essential for health care. In addition to advance and mandatory appropriations for IHS, Congress must address the following in order to treat cr true parity in the IHS system for UIHPs specifically. 100% FMAP, VA, IHS, or UIHP MOU implementation, the Federal Tort Claims Act coverage for UIHPs, as well as an increased urban Indian health line item of at least $81 million. Congress can prioritize these policy issues to really make some change and serve the entirety of Indian country, both on and off the reservations. I therefore ask you to immediately work on these issues. The obligations of the federal government to us as tribal citizens doesn't change just because our address does. The, it, the lives of Native people depend on this, and your trust obligation is to see it through. Thank you for your time. Nyawe. Thank you very much. Mrs. Uh, Ms. Trottier. Chairman Alba and members of the committee, my name is Mary Green Trottier. I'm a member of the Spirit Lake Sioux Nation and president of the National Association of Food Distribution Programs on Indian Reservations. I also serve as the director for my food distribution program in Fort Houghton, North Dakota, where we regularly serve approximately 850 people through FDPIR each month. I would like to thank the committee for asking me to testify today on the impacts of the current partial government shutdown on FDPIR and Indian country. To truly understand the impacts of the government shutdown for our program, it's important to have a sense of our program's current positive impact across Indian country and on the tribal members and also non-tribal community members who rely on it. The food distribution programs on Indian reservations provides food packages for nearly 100,000 people each month across 276 tribes in rural native communities located in food deserts with little or no access to grocery stores or transportation to the stores to redeem SNAP benefits. A significant number of elders rely on food distribution. Nearly half of our participants are over the age of 60 and the average age of our participants is 54. Over half are currently employed but need the help of our program the help our program offers to make ends meet each month. We also offer nutrition education and employ tribal members at 102 tribal organizations across the country. The most widespread impact of the shutdown so far is the fear and uncertainty that our tribal members and the others who rely on it for food assistance are feeling. Since the shutdown began, our ITOs all over the country have been receiving calls from concerned tribal leaders, program participants, federal employees who are furloughed, and our own ITO staff 
all of them are worried that our program is not in operation at all. We have done our best to reassure our community members and others. Some of our ITOs are even issuing press releases and communications to the tribal community, letting them know that we are still open. But it's difficult to be reassuring when we know that we only have administrative funds through the end of January. After that, our situation becomes very problematic. Even if there are funds available, the questions remain whether or not our ITOs can draw down on the program funds. In addition to this fear and uncertainty, we are struggling to find the funds to remain open and serve our communities beyond January 31st, should the shutdown continue that long. Some of our ITOs have already began furloughing employees to try and extend the time they can keep their doors open. Boise Fort in um, Minnesota, for example, is being run with only one staff member to manage their program. While USDA has said our food delivery should continue through February, at some point we will be forced to close due to the lack of administrative funds, leaving no one there to receive that food. Some food deliveries have already been stalled. For example, a shipment of dried cranberries or craisins has been held at the national warehouses because the computer update that generates the inventory code for it did not go out prior to the shutdown. That food will sit there until the shutdown ends. Another one of our programs in the Midwest region just ran out of ground beef yesterday. More potentially is on the way, but the shutdown creates uncertainty and fear for those people. Even after that, it, may still, it still may not make it to our participants if the best if used by date on the product is, in, is within one month window of delivery. At that point, the food cannot be, by USDA rules, distributed to us. So because of the shutdown, we may miss out on some foods entirely even though they have already been purchased, paid for, and designated for our participants. A recent example of the best if used by concern comes from what happened in 2018 due to an adjusted USDA administrative policy and the take rate for bison. Thousand pounds, thousands of pounds of ground bison ran out of their best if used by date and had to be donated to food ban banks instead of given to our program. Bison is a traditional food that we fought hard to get into the food package and at a value of $700,000, it did not make it to our program participants. A prolonged shutdown will only increase the frequency of paying for food that we cannot give out. We are totally without administrative support. Our ITOs have no IT support for any daily operations that go wrong. One of our ITOs serving Santee Sioux in, was unable to place food orders because of a computer error and could not have their technical experts solve the program, the issue, because they are on furlough. The lag time in ordering this small technical issue left the site with limited food options, including fresh produce for several weeks. Further, the shutdown is impacting our local economies and we are seeing an increase in participation for the program. Many in our, peop in our communities who are furloughed federal employees who are working without pay are now requesting to apply for the program since they have no income to support and feed their families. While our ITOs are working with those who are in desperate need of services during the shutdown, many of the people who need assistance are concerned with the way the rules are written for FDPIR, they will be penalized. So our tribal governments have to choose between providing food or medicine for our most vulnerable people. During this shutdown, we are told to make do with what little we have. But in Indian country and in FDPIR, we have already been making do with very little for a long time. If the shutdown continues, we may be forced to make do with nothing. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you so much for your testimony. Before we proceed, let me uh, acknowledge um, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, who has joined us, chair of our Financial Services Committee. Congressman uh, Kilner from Washington, member of the Appropriations Committee, and also Congresswoman Jackson Lee, uh, member of the Judiciary Committee. So thank you all for being here. We're going to proceed uh, with both panels, 
and then we'll open for uh, questions. And we're going to start in the order of arrival for members uh, with the first question from Congresswoman Holland. Uh, Dr. Payment. Ani Buju B Waka Jigandition Nakas, Makwa Megizi and Dorum, Bawating and Donjaba, Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, Odawa, Otawatimi and Dao. I'm the chairperson of the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians and also the first vice president for the National Congress of American Indians. On behalf of Indian Country, thank you for holding ceded land to make this country great. We have a unique perspective. This shutdown violates the trust responsibility to, of, uh, to tribal governments and adds to the trail of broken treaties. Federal agencies that provide critical government services to our nations are caught up in unrelated politics over funding for a southern border wall. Meanwhile, our tribal welfare hangs in the balance. No matter who is at fault, the shutdown threatens to abrogate the treaty and trust obligation to tribes. Federal funding that tribes receive is woefully inadequate to begin with yet is based on the cessation of 500 million acres of land that American Indian tribes ceded to the federal government. My tribe and four other tribes in Michigan in the 1836 Treaty of Washington ceded 14 million acres of land in exchange for our rights to hunt and gather and fish and health, education, and social welfare into perpetuity. Tribes prepaid in full for our federal funding. Since we cannot foreclose on the land, we expect the federal government to fulfill the treaty and trust responsibility. I'm here to remind the Trump administration that your mortgage payment is due. The BIA and IHS are the main agencies responsible for providing these services, either through direct service, 638 compacts, or self-governance contracts. Some tribes already subsidize the federal government's financial obligation, but please realize that nearly 60% of tribes do not have access to Indian gaming. That's 60 percent, or lack sufficient resources for meaningful economic development and face unnecessary bureaucratic and regulatory burdens that create inequities and disadvantages to true self-determination. Ironically, the Americans most affected by immigration over the last 500 years continue to be the most heavily impacted by the shuttering of multiple federal agencies that are unrelated to securing our homeland. Our communities rely on federal funding to administer key government services, health care facilities, public safety, housing access, nutrition and food distribution, and social services. The shutdown is causing widespread destabilization of these programs and generating fear and anxiety among our tribal citizens and our workforce. My written testimony shares several examples of the impact in Indian country. If time permits during the questions, I will do my best to provide a broad cross-section of the impacts. I respectfully ask that we be permitted to revise and extend our input to the impacts of shutdown after today's hearing. Thousands of BIA and IHS employees, many of whom are tribal citizens, are furloughed and working without pay. Federal BIA and IHS employees should be receiving a paycheck but are now struggling to pay their own household bills and mortgages. Furloughs and missed paychecks are hurting each affected employee and their families and their tribal communities. During the last government shutdown and with the impacts of sequestration, my tribe ate about $1 million in lost federal revenues. We lost a physician and five medical staff. This is a long-term impact in rural reservation communities because we have difficulty recruiting and retaining uh, medical, dental, behavioral health, and other professional staff. Two of my tribal citizens who work as IHS directors serving other tribes are currently working without pay. While overlapping federal budgets and fiscal years make it difficult to enumerate the fiscal impact of the shutdown for tribes, my tribe's annual funding prorated per day amounts to about $100,000. Federal drawdowns are important to tribal cash flow. Once the full impact hits us of not being able to draw down our self-governance funding, which is today, by the way, our funding is due today that we won't receive. We will have to borrow from tribal services to be able to operate, and even then it's only a couple of weeks. I'm concerned about how we will fill the life-sustaining prescriptions for treatment of diabetes, heart disease, and Vivitrol as part of our medically-assisted treatment for the opiate crisis, for which Indians are as hard hit as any population in this country. Like most tribes, we fulfill life-sustaining treatment for cancer through purchase and referred services or care, formerly contract health. Cutting off our medicine supply for tribes and PRC funding can and will become life-threatening. This shutdown crystallizes the need for IHS funding to become mandatory. 
if IHS funding were outside of the annual discretionary appropriations process, tribes would not have to worry each day if their programs are going to be funded. IHS should be funded through advanced appropriations, which would ensure that the basic health services for tribes are uninterrupted. The IHS should be afforded at least the same budgetary certainty as Veterans Administration and Healthcare, which is also forward funded. There's already an example of how this is done. Finally, tribes should be reimbursed for any costs incurred during government shutdowns. And how do you do that? You just add language that says if we're reimbursing states and American Indian tribes. So my conclusion is tribal nations are resilient and we provide services to around 2 million people. However, we can't continue to provide for communities without our federal partners upholding their obligation. After all, a government is only as good as its word. So I thank you and I welcome any questions and offer my ongoing assistance and that of the National Congress of American Indians in helping to gather additional input in Indian country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jarvis. <clears throat> thank you to the committee uh, for holding this hearing um, on the longest shutdown in the federal government history um, and its impact uh, to our national parks and public lands. And I also want to thank um, our fellow panelists here that are speaking so eloquently about the impacts to Indian country as well. I serve as the executive director for the Institute for Parks, People, and Biodiversity at the University of California, uh, Berkeley, and prior to that um, served as the 18th director of the National Park Service uh, for uh, both terms of President Barack Obama. Um, and uh, in the 1995 uh, furlough, I was uh, a non-essential employee uh, furloughed. Um, and in the 2013 uh, shutdown, I was the director and made the decision to close all of the national parks uh, for the 16-day shutdown. Um, that decision, I believe, was principled, uh, and it was based on um, the statutory responsibilities of the National Park Service uh, to conserve these places unimpaired uh, for the enjoyment of future generations. Uh, that decision was not political. Uh, I received no input from the White House or any other political appointee to make that decision. It was based on the principle of protecting our parks. The Na U.S. national park system is respected around the world. We host over 300 million visitors each year, including tens of millions of visitors from around the world. Um, delegations from other nations come to the U.S. to understand how we can protect these extraordinary places at the same time hosting millions of visitors. And this is because there is a professional organization, the National Park Service, employing over 20,000 public servants on the job every day, providing for resources, protection, and the safety of our visiting public. When the government shuts down, the majority of those employees are told they're non-essential which I think is patently false. The National Park Service employees are essential to meeting the mandate of protecting the parks and the visitor. Without the NPS employee, both the park and the visitors are at risk. For instance, at Joshua Tree National Park, which has been in the news quite a bit these days, in last December, December of 17, the park hosted 284,000 visitors. The park is uh, well-loved and well-visited. Uh, it's named uh, by early pioneers for the Joshua Tree with its arms outstretched towards heaven. Under normal operations, there'd be 125 employees. Uh, maintenance, rangers, uh, firefighters, trail crew, biologists, archaeologists. They would also be supervising many volunteers um, doing active work. Um, under the shutdown, there were eight employees. And as a result, um, there was visible damage to the resource, uh, people driving off the road, as you've probably reported, seen in the press, uh, Joshua trees cut down uh, to open up new areas to drive off the road, um, uh, trash piling up, uh, toilets overflowing, and the park superintendent decided this was untenable uh, and to shut down the park. Uh, and then he was subsequently ordered to reopen the park uh, using his fee monies. This is no different than the Smithsonian, uh, where uh, we have priceless artifacts inside. So should we consider that the Albert Bierstadt painting of Yosemite Valley that hangs in the Smithsonian requires protection, but that Yosemite Valley itself does not? The decision I made in 2013 definitely had its consequences, and it was painful to the gateway communities, 
the people that had planned vacations, and even people who had planned weddings. Every day during the shutdown, we worked to mitigate these impacts. And through the closure period, we worked with a variety of efforts, including states, to provide funding. We provided First Amendment access to the war memorials on the Mall as well. The decision by President Donald Trump and DOI Secretary Ryan Zinke to leave the parks open and to furlough the NPS staff is an advocation of their stewardship responsibilities to our national parks. Many of the issues that we are seeing could have been avoided, but now we are seeing them come to pass with overflowing toilets, visitor access, and accidents and damage to resources. Now, I believe that most of the visitors that are still coming to the parks are respectful and they want to do no harm, uh, but they may cause inadvertent impacts and then, unfortunately, there's always a little segment of American society out there who will take advantage of this situation and do intentional damage, um, some of which will be long-lasting uh, to both natural and cultural resources. And now the administration is directing the parks to use their fee accounts to pay for park staff. Now, on one hand, I'm, I'm positive that the employees are happy to return to work uh, and be paid. On the other hand, these funds were intended by law to enhance the visitor experience and the resource and not for basic operations. By burning through these accounts for operations, the parks will not be able to use the funds to address their maintenance backlog or to improve the park for the visitor. Thank you for this opportunity, and I'll be submitting a, a I have submitted a, a written statement for the record. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Mr. Ash. Thank you, Ms. Lee and, and members. Um, you have my written testimony, which is endorsed by the National Wildlife Refuge Association. In my 22-year career with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I helped the organization endure three shutdowns. During the 2013 shutdown, um, like John Jarvis, I was the Senate-confirmed director of the service. Each of those shutdowns was debilitating to the mission and the operation of the agency, disruptive to longstanding relationships with partners, constituents, and regulated communities, and demoralizing for the outstanding professionals who dedicate their lives to public service. Hearty amen to bipartisan voices like Representative Fitzpatrick's, who said, no shutdown is good. And let me express my sympathy and my admiration for the public servants managing this shutdown. They are tasked to extract sanity from an insane situation. Every shutdown is chaos. And managing a shutdown is chaos on top of chaos. In each of the shutdowns I endured, we followed a simple, strict, and conservative policy. Closed means close. This supported consistent and clear answers as we address question, concern, and criticism from the myriad people and interests affected. The service's work is multifaceted and it's global. And the most pernicious effects of the shutdown are those you'll really never see. Uh, for instance, in May of this year, 182 nations will meet in Sri Lanka for the 18th Conference of the Parties to the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. This treaty regulates global trade in 35,000 species. And this COP will be a crucial moment in the fight against extinction. The U.S. is the recognized world leader. Every employee who works on this has been furloughed. But the jagged edge of shutdown controversy surrounds the National Wildlife Refuge System, the world's largest system of protected lands and waters. 567 units, 836 million acres, and over 50 million visitors who are locked out. There was always tremendous pressure to make uh, closures more surgical. Couldn't some refuges remain open, perhaps under state or volunteer management, perhaps using fee or carryover funds, perhaps leave gates open and visitors unattended. In our view, none of this was appropriate or lawful. The refuge system's organic statute requires that the director manage a refuge system, not select priority refuges and certainly not select and temporary uses like elk hunting or a bird festival. Finally, um, we need to remember that while the elk hunter and the bird watcher is affected, the principal victims of this shutdown are the outstanding public servants who are furloughed, and especially those who are accepted and required 
to continue working without pay. The wage grade employee who keeps a national fish hatchery running but can't make car and mortgage payments. The refuge officer, a single parent deployed to the southern border. The national zoo zookeeper with childcare and commuting expenses exceeding $450 a week. She is paying the government to work. They have no choice. They must report for work without pay. They are indentured servants. Adding insult to injury, this past Friday, they all received a pay statement, zero. May, over the weekend, many of them were publishing them, posting them on Facebook and Twitter and other accounts, expressing their frustration. They, their families, and their well-being should be top of mind. They deserve much, much better. Dr. Pepper Trail works at the Clark R. Bavin National Fish and Wildlife Forensics Laboratory in Ashland, Oregon. Her scientific expertise and work supports cutting-edge law enforcement throughout the world. She is furloughed, and therefore, she has time to apply her other talents. Yesterday, she published a poem entitled Pantome for Furlough, and I'd like to share with you two of her verses. Empty-handed, we are given furlough. My colleagues and I turned away. The doors are locked against us and all the work that we would do. My colleagues and I turned away classified as mere non-essential, and all the work that we would do deemed to be, what's the word? Worthless. Contrast her feelings with this recent statement by the American Petroleum Association's chief executive officer. To this point, we have not seen any major effects of the shutdown on our industry, no doubt. Thank you very much for holding this hearing and giving us the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. That says it all. Let me just mention, um, we've been joined now by our colleague, member of the Natural Resources Committee, uh, Congressman uh, Ruben Gallego. Thank you, Congressman. Okay, now we'll go to Mr. Ring. Thank you, and, um, Ms. Lean, members of the committee, for the opportunity to appear before you today on behalf of the Coalition to Protect America's National Parks. Um, in my uh, 33 years of, of uh, service with the National Park Service, I was 20 years as a superintendent and four years as an associate director, um, including um, serving in Everglades National Park as the superintendent during the 1995 and 96 shutdowns. Um, and um, the, the coalition that I represent here today um, is comprised of more than 1,600 members. Um, mostly predominantly retired uh, Park Service employees. They represent over 35,000 years of experience in managing national parks. Um, the resources of the national parks are being damaged and put at risk uh, of further irreparable harm. There are already reports of damage to resources at parks that were directed to remain open destruction of iconic resources, widespread accumulation of trash and related habituation of wildlife, human waste on trails due to closed restrooms, vandalism of property and destruction of habitat from off-road vehicle use have all been reported. Further, under the condition parks are being kept open, visitors are being subjected to a degraded experience that could hardly be called enjoyable, often exposing them to health and safety risks. The shutdown is also having a serious and adverse effect on NPS employees. Over 21,000 employees by the Park Service's own uh, statistics have been sent home as non-essential. About 3,200 uh, employees have been retained to continue working as essential employees. None of them are being paid. The longer the shutdown goes on, the more adverse effects on morale and retention will accumulate. Equally, the loss of salaries to the local communities and the disruption of the levels of, of visitor spending in local communities is having a sub similar and substantial effect on individuals and businesses around the parks. 
The Department of Interior has instructed the Park Service to make use of unobligated balances of fee money to pay certain park employees in order to perform basic maintenance and visitor service functions. Fee money was always intended to supplement appropriated funds, not to replace them. Even the use of these funds to bring back non-essential personnel to perform basic maintenance and visitor services in some parks is only stopgap relief. Irreparable harm has occurred, already occurred, to park operations as well and will steadily increase the longer the shutdown goes on. When and if the shutdown ends, that interrupted work will begin, but much of it cannot be accomplished in the time remaining before the onset of the, of the uh, busy summer visitor season. The Acting Secretary of Interior is charged by Congress with preserving the resources of our national parks and providing for their enjoyment unimpaired for future generation. However, he describes the NPS Organic Act as charging the NPS with a dual mission of conserving park resources and providing for their enjoyment. He states that we must provide opportunities for people to access and enjoy our wonderful parks, and we must do so in a way that ensures the same opportunity for future generations. While there are two purposes here, the first to conserve and protect the national parks is unqualified. The second, to provide for their enjoyment, has a significant qualification to leave them unimpaired. Mr. Brandt's, uh, Mr. Bernhardt's memo overlooks this critical statutory distinction entirely. Make no mistake, we want the parks open. However, we believe keeping them open without a full level of protection of park resources disregards the law and without providing a safe and fully enjoyable visitor experience, it is, un is unconscionable. The parks, the national parks, should not be held hostage in this shutdown, subjecting them to irreparable harm and exposing them to an unacceptable risk of, of further impairment while providing visitors with such a degraded and often unsafe experience. The coalition will be glad to continue to work with you in order to return the parks to normal operations and to understand and address the impacts of this shutdown. This concludes my statement, and, and um, if I may submit the full statement for the record, I'd be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Now we will go to the uh, questions from our members. We're asking members uh, to uh, utilize three minutes in, a in asking their question and direct it to the members of the, of the panel. We'll start with Congresswoman uh, Deb Holland from New Mexico. Okay. Thank, thank you, you um, Madam Chair. Th thank you all so much for taking the time to be here today and um, for your am amazing caring about the communities that you serve. I'm just very grateful for your time here. Um, I, I wanted to, I have two questions. One, I think I can um, uh, ask Dr. Payment, uh, because I, this is the longest shutdown in history. And uh, so I want to know from you in, in the work that you're doing, have you ever seen a crisis as devastating as this to your community or the communities that you serve as a, as a official of NCAI? First, I would say, um, as a tribal nation that uh, was not automatically recognized, we had to seek to get recognition. We had to acquire all the land. And until we got federal recognition, we didn't have any resources. We didn't have access to IHS. And somehow, we, we made do as a community. But we were very poor then. We had, I grew up without indoor plumbing. Um, the disease, um, our, our life expectancy was about 50 years old. Um, the federal government fulfilling the treaty and trust responsibility is helping us to, to live our American dream, our American Indian dream. And these threats, um, I haven't seen anything like this. Um, we went through the shutdown and sequestration the last time, um, but we haven't seen anything this threatening. 
Um, in my testimony, I had mentioned, so I have family members who are using Vivitrol as medical assisted treatment to prevent them from overdosing, from preventing them from going to the street to get fentanyl and overdosing. And so this really is life-threatening. Uh, Vivitrol helps to curtail the, the need for the addiction. It doesn't replace it with another addiction. So for me, it's very personal because I have immediate family <coughs> who, whose lives will be put at risk if they don't have access to their treatment and their medicines. And so this is, this is a crisis like we've never seen. Thank you. We had uh, someone in our community before the passage of the Affordable Care Act who did have to make those decisions. Am I going to treat my diabetes uh, or am I going to uh, get food for myself and for my family and things that are very treatable and manageable um, continue to decline and the health status is worse and that puts a burden on not just us, um, their family and, and the overall system. So it, it, it's a lowering, a, a decline of the contemporary health status of Native people that is completely avoidable. And, and again, the, the care for our people is part of that trust responsibility and it just shouldn't occur. The impact of our program not offering food to our people would be devastating. Uh, a lot of our, our elderly, our children, they rely on our program they basically wouldn't have food or access to fresh fruits and vegetables that they receive from our program. And the impact of the shutdown as a whole, uh, the warehouses are being depleted. There's no food coming in. During the 2013 shutdown, our warehouses were completely bare and there were very limited food options available for up to a year, it, that's how long it took. And that wasn't, the shutdown didn't last as long as this one. Great, uh, next uh, will be an, another historic uh, candidacy in election. Uh, we're joined by uh, Kansan uh, Sharice Davids. We're so fortunate that the first two Native Americans in Congress came in pairs uh, and are women. So, <laughs> Sharice. Uh, well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you. Uh, first, uh, just broadly, thank you to the chairs of the Steering and Policy and Natural Resources Committees for um, making sure that these important issues are being um, brought to the forefront and being um, spoken about, because sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, you know, I spent this weekend uh, at home in Kansas speaking with some of the uh, a f just a handful of the nearly 19,000 federal employees in the Kansas City metro area that are impacted by this shutdown. Um, among them uh, was, uh, although there are there are four tribes in Kansas, none um, reside in in the district that I currently represent. Um, but as we know, we live in an ecosystem, and all of all of us are connected. And uh, the there is an office of the special trustee under the Department of Interior that um, has close to 160 people who are currently furloughed, some contractors, some employees. And um, so I, I know that although we're talking right now about some of the issues with specific tribes or um, organizations, um, that this affects all of us. And I want to, I guess one of the things, um, Chairman Payment, I would love to hear you um, explain to us is, what do you think the long-term ramifications of, the f of not just the, um, the furloughed employees, but also I know you, your, um, your tribal citizens play a significant role in the region um, that, you, that you currently are in. So can you talk a little bit about that, please? Sure. Um, so I did share uh, a couple of examples in my testimony, but we didn't get to it. But um, so tribes as service providers is one notion, but tribes as the uh, engine for economic development in the communities in which we live, we're generally the largest employer wherever we're at. 
And um, so some of the effects in the Coville tribes are losing about $400,000 per day um, and about $1.2 million per week because they're not able to uh, practice their timber harvesting and forestry activities. And so also the uh, native contractors, the Hawaiian contractors, Alaska Native Corporations are losing about a quarter of a million dollars per day. And also um, 300 jobs uh, for some federal contractors are, are, are on furlough. And so when we talk about how do we make tribes self-reliant and self-determined, it's not only a matter of providing the services that are required per the treaties, it's also helping tribes when they are finding ways to stimulate economies so that we aren't uh, losing ground there as well. So we are integrated wherever we're located, and our largest employer generally stimulate those economies, and we're intermarried in many cases throughout those communities, and so the entire community suffers when we suffer. Thank you. Um, and then I, I, I did want to ask um, Ms. Hawk Lesser about the, I noticed in the testimony that uh, mental and behavioral health, um, the line item for that was very small. Can you speak to uh, the impacts of both the trauma that needs to be addressed as well as, um, again, kind of longer term effects on every day that, that people are not receiving service? Sure, thank you. Um, Native American Lifelines is a trauma-informed care provider. Um, you know, a lot of our clients is, are experiencing deep trauma just personally and from their, their families. I have a relative who's a boarding school survivor. That, that all plays a role. And, and so the substance abuse we don't see without the, the mental health. That's the foundation of, of the problem. And, you know, we see that our people are... Um, abusing drugs as a way to cope with that trauma. I would say in Baltimore, the situation is a little bit reverse as to what you see in other places. The, the drugs that my community is most abusing is not coming from the southern border. They're coming from prescription pads. It's easy to go to um, pain management hmm. clinics or your provider and, and just get a prescription that either our people abuse or they sell. And, and so that has, that along with the uh, proliferation of fentanyl in Baltimore has really created an alarming rate of suicide overdose and fatality in our community. And, and the bad part about it, in, in Baltimore, you can be white, black, Asian, Latino, or other. Um, and so our people aren't even being counted. So if I'm trying to not be so dependent on IHS funding and I want to talk about the severity of the problem, I don't even have the numbers to do that because we are statistically othered and that's just not a problem in terms of data collection, but that's dehumanizing. We know who we are. So it's, it's, it's all interrelated and $691, I, I get LabQuest bills that are for more than that for just me. Thank you. We're gonna go to Ms. Kelly of Illinois. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the witnesses. Uh, your, the stories are heartbreaking, and it sounds like from what you're saying, regardless of the shutdown or not, we need to do better by all of you than we're doing right now. Nothing to do with the shutdown. Just curious for uh, all of you, have you been contacted by the administration? Do Are they hearing your stories or interested in your stories or are they hearing anything, whether it's the parks or Indian country? During the uh, 2013 uh, shutdown, um, in advance, the Obama administration um, held uh, tribal leader calls and alerted us and um, urged us to take advantage of uh, getting drawdowns early, uh, created uh, basically a triage plan for how to deal with the shutdown. Um, with this shutdown, we were given less than 24 hours notice, um, and IHS did have a call last week, a tribal leader call, um, and the staff, first of all, I, I don't want to disparage the staff. They're, they're doing their best with what they have, um, but there's no answers that are coming. It's basically, please continue to provide services. Um, I asked the question, will, be, will be, we be reimbursed? And the answer is we don't know. Um, and so this was very ill-conceived, ill-prepared. Um, the administration is not reaching out across the agencies. And, and some of it is because those people who otherwise would do those outreach, like Tara Sweeney, is on furlough. Right. So the, the Assistant Secretary uh, for American Indian Issues is on furlough. So she can't 
even call it. The assistant secretary is The on assistant furlough. secretary is on furlough. And she's our lead American Indian to reach out and yes, say, yes. this is how this will work. She can't even, I have her cell phone, so I call her, but mm -hmm. she said I can't answer questions mm -hmm. on, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so there, I don't know that this was very, was planned. I think it was kind of a spur of the moment, knee jerk reaction to, uh, you know, a wing of his party that forced this shutdown. But no, the, the administration is not doing the kind of outreach to tribes so that we understand what our options are. It was difficult pulling together testimony to try to find out what the impacts are having because the people that you would ask the questions are not working. Right. How about for parks? Any outreach? I would say speak for the coalition there. There is no outreach at all. In fact, just the opposite. Um, trying to reach in um, on behalf of the press tribe to, uh, to talk to uh, the employees that are still deemed essential and there. And um, they've been told not to talk to the press and refer all, all questions to Washington. And uh, trust me, the press interviews in Washington are refused. Yeah, I'll just add that um, in my conversations with folks that are in the field, um, there is a uh, an element of fear um, that has been conveyed down uh, that uh, you will be punished if you uh, if you speak out. Um, certainly, if you speak to the press. Um, so, um, and uh, you know, all decisions uh, related to parks uh, are being made at the departmental level uh, and coming back down uh, to, to the superintendents. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kelly. Uh, Mr. Gallego of Arizona. Thank you very much. I'm lucky enough to represent Arizona and have some very large uh, tribes in terms of just uh, land mass. And one of the concerns that I've been hearing from my friends in uh, Indian country is just regular transportation because right now in our high country we're getting uh, snow. And so people can't even move to get medicine, get food. Have you heard of any of these experience, similar experiences in terms of traffic management, weather mitigation, things of that nature that usually the federal government takes care of? And what, what is the impact it's having uh, on Indian country and Indian families right now? Zare, we start with you, Ms. Uh, hawk -Lazard. Uh, I represent an urban Indian community, so I'm not directly impacted. Um, I do have a brother and family that live on Pine Ridge, and the thought that they won't have ambulance services shortly frightens me because I know how remote and how hard the winters are, and I, I fear for them. So that's about as much as I know. We haven't had... Um a lot of impact as of yet, but after January 31st, our food will not make it out of the warehouses because there will be nobody in those warehouses if we don't have some relief with the administrative funds that are due to our program. Um, so President Begay of the Navajo Nation and I have been kind of like teaming up on uh, different releases and stuff. And so wherever, wherever he is, I am, and wherever I am, he is. Um, so tribes, the impact on tribes is different depending on if you're direct service or if you're compacted or self-governance. So um, as big as the Navajo Nation is, they have funding coming in, in a number of different ways. And for their transportation, it's a direct service from the federal government. <laughs> and the road plowing uh, during their storm uh, two years ago when the shutdown, or two weeks ago when the shutdown happened, they were not able to get to food. So they already have challenges of 50 miles away to go get food, but they couldn't get because the roads were impassable because they had a, a storm. So we had a storm here just the other day, so people stayed home, basically. And uh, so uh, tribes for transportation are being impacted, especially direct service tribes immediately are impacted. Uh, thank you. All right, uh, Chairman Gohalba, do you have any questions? <laughs> whom I worked with in the past. And I don't know if things were easier, but they were sure uh, a lot more honest. And uh, Mr. Ash, Mr. Ring, you mentioned uh, that irreparable harm has already been done to our parks and public lands. And as this shutdown continues, that's added on. It just adds on to it. So there's short-term and long-term. 
given the fact, and it is a fact, that our public lands and parks refuge have been under tremendous stress from this administration to begin with in terms of their mission and in terms of what is considered a resource and what isn't. Uh, and how does this shutdown now aggravate that, number one? And number two, uh, long term, how do you see us, besides ending this silly sh shutdown that's all driven by ego, anything else, how do we recover from this as we go forward, from your, based on your experience? A long, slow road in in regards to the the damage and the impacts, as well as as the uh, the normal return to um, operations. Um, and um, so so even starting now, um, there will be delays in likely be delays in the um, preparation for the onset of the coming season. Um, in terms of irreparable harm uh, and uh, what rises to the level of impairment in the national parks. Um, when, when you see the iconic Joshua trees in that, in that park alone being cut by vandals trying to get off-road vehicles onto fragile desert habitat, that's just a, 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 uh, an example of, of what's at risk. And um, I, think, I think when the longer this goes on, the greater the risk and the greater the harm will, will accumulate. It will take probably some time to, after it's over, to assess the full extent of, of those impacts. And, there, and, and you can't repair them. Jarvis? Um, I think there'll be cascading effects uh, of the existing shutdown and even more so uh, they will accumulate if this goes on much longer. A uh, couple of examples. This is the time of year that we, in many parks, uh, are reducing fuel loads in preparation of fire season. Right. Um, our fire crews would be burning piles, uh, doing prescribed burning. All of that is, uh, has been stopped. Um, our maintenance crews are planning uh, for summer projects. Uh, all of that has been stopped and doing their compliance. Um, summer seasonal hiring is beginning, should be beginning now. Um, as we would be uh, putting out applications for hiring some eight to 10,000 um, young people to work in our parks in the summer, all of that is stopped. Um, so this will have a ripple effect uh, through the operations for at least a year uh, and beyond uh, from the shutdown. And then there are other you know, re serious resource impacts. I was told that uh, there were three deer poached in, in Great Smoky Mountains this last week. Um, that there have been a, a, a huge increase in breaking and enterings into buildings uh, in parks because they are not being guarded, as well as as the uh, as the Joshua Tree incident as well. And I'm sure we're going to be seeing all kinds of incidents uh, once we get back in and can actually uh, assess. Mr. Ash, we mentioned iconic parks. Can you other parks are being hurt as well that 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 you know of have been. Yeah, well, the the um, National Wildlife Refuge System, as, as, I, as I said, is the nation's lar or the world's largest Sorry. system of protected lands and waters. And when you think about the, the, this time of year is the time when you plan a field season. And so we, we've now, we're now um, on the 25th day of this shutdown. When you lose, um, when you lose four weeks in the, at this time of year, um, all of the logistical work that goes into the things like John Jarvis was talk, just talking about, prescribed fire, field work, the, all of that work is being done now. And so when you think about a place like Alaska where we have 80 million acres of national wildlife refuges, they're in the process of planning an entire field season now. Um, you can't lose four weeks and not have an impact on a field season. And, and so... Um, the work will go undone. We'll miss a whole field season of work, uh, likely um, of much work in Alaska because of, because of this shutdown. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Payman, just one quick question. Trust responsibility that, that every member of Congress uh, swears to. Uh, and uh, that trust responsibility is uh, important. I think uh, I just wanted to ask you in terms of advocacy, 
in terms of the, of the impacts that we heard about in Indian country. Uh, is every member being talked about that they have uh, a responsibility in this issue beyond uh, waiting it out <laughs> to offer solutions? I think we've offered solutions that it's time that the Senate took their part in it and then we can end this thing. But uh, I just want to know what the, what the advocacy that you know of is going on to make sure that every member understands they have a trust responsibility to, to deal with this issue and deal with it now. Well, first of all, I, we are appreciative to our friends in Congress, whether they have American Indians in their districts or not. And uh, the work that you do to help get the word out, this hearing is, is phenomenal that will help get the word out to your colleagues. Uh, a lot of times, if there's not a large tribe within a district, they, they don't understand the treaty and trust responsibility. A lot of people uh, will ask, why should we honor these antiquated documents in the treaties? And I remind them, yes, they are old, but they are not as old as the U.S. Constitution for which they are pursuant to. And so as long as we honor our Constitution, we have to honor those treaties. Judicial precedents have upheld that. So the National Congress of American Indians does our best. Uh, the Midwest Alliance of Sovereign Tribes, the United Tribes of Michigan, of which I'm the president of as well, um, and we are contacting our, our legislators and reminding them of their treaty and trust responsibility. But there is ongoing work that's needed. I was talking with uh, Congresswoman uh, McCollum the other day on how do we get this message out repeatedly, ongoing. And uh, so we stand ready in Indian country to help you in that. In that. But we do it um, constituent to constituent. But if there's some additional way we can get the word out, we stand ready to help you with that. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. We'll go now to Congresswoman Betty McCollum and then back to Congresswoman uh, Deb Holland for close. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Lee. I, uh, interest, the interesting conversation that you were having earlier about food versus health care or health care versus food, they're inseparable, especially when it comes to diabetes and the SNAP program as well as what's, what's going on with uh, the treaty trust responsibilities for, for some food programs. You, you can't have one without the other. And many medicines are, are needed to go with certain types of food in order for them to be effective. So thank you for bringing that up. I'm going to, to the to my Native American brother sister panel, I have um, uh, two questions and I'll put them out there and then I have uh, uh, questions for that I'll put out to the, the, the uh, natural resources panel. In the shutdown with what's happening, you touched on this a little bit. But could you uh, tell me more about what your concern is going to happen with medical personnel staff, how they could leave, so seek employment elsewhere, just not, let alone not be there, not be uh, available to provide health care. And um, this is something that we've been having hearings and grappling with here in Congress. This is only going to act, uh, make this worse. If you could um, maybe talk about that for a second. And then I'll ask my other question to... Um, um, our um, our friend here from uh, Spirit Lake. So uh, BIE schools, they're funded, and there's federal staff that supports uh, the child nutrition programs. They've been furloughed. So can you tell me what's going on with school nutrition right now? What's happening with the cafeteria programs? How many children are sitting in the classroom hungry with their stomachs growling? As a teacher, I know that's not a good thing. So if you could, if the three of you could please uh, tackle that. I, I'm not uh, sure of the um, impact of the BIE schools, um, but in Indian country, we won't let anybody go hungry, um, and the impact n will be devastating. If you don't have nutritious food to feed children, they are not going to perform well or retain any knowledge without food. So that's something we have to check on, or maybe you know Mr. Payman. Yeah, so um, I'm a former president of our school board, um, and um, we have an award-winning school. Our standardized test scores are double digits higher than the local school district. Um, we have 80% free and reduced, so it will have an impact in our community. But um, like you said, we, we won't let those kids go hungry. Some way or another, we will. But we shouldn't have to. We shouldn't have to borrow from money that is programs and services money that will take it from someplace else in order to do that. One other direct impact for BIE schools is uh, operation and maintenance funds and facilities. We already have a backlog um, at the rate that we're going. It'll take about 300 years to get caught up to build the travel schools. 
Uh, so we're hoping for an infrastructure bill to do tribal schools. Um, but uh, facilities operation and maintenance is frozen right now. And so the access to those funds is not available. And we already have the worst schools. And so in many cases, those schools need that operation and maintenance dollars, and it's critical. In some cases, it's to continue to have heat in the school. And, and just everybody agrees that this is going to hurt your ability to recruit and retain staff for our, our, our hospital and health care facilities. Is, that, is this not true? And just a quick answer, and I'll get to the parks. Yes, I think it's definitely going to impact, and, and speaking probably for a lot of programs, we have open positions that we can't fill at this, at this point in time. Um, so I want to just ask about, um, I'm going to ask a director, um, former Director Ash this question, and I have one for you, Mr. Um, Mr. Jarvis, as well. Um, closed is closed. Yet, um, the Akron Secretary Bernhardt's decision has been to open certain refuges. In the meantime, as he's picking winners and losers, there's being winners and losers picked among the federal staff. Um, so this decision is bringing back employees and then classifying some of them as exempt, meaning they'll be paid, while others are going to be, for example, law enforcement personnel um, won't be paid. So now you have two federal employees, because the decision's been made to pick winners and looters, losers among the refugees, uh, uh, refuge, excuse me, creating economic refugees, I might say, for, for many families out here in America without uh, getting their paycheck. Uh, how does that, you know, how, how does that work? How is that being a good employer? Well, it's, it, it's not. And what it does is it pits one employee against the other. Like opening, opening certain refuges pits uh, one refuge against another. It's not managing a system of refuge lands, and it's not managing an organization of employees. To, to, to require a, a law enforcement officer to work um, uh, and not pay them and then bring a, a public use specialist on board so that you can have a, an elk hunt. And paying them, and so um, so it it, cre it creates animosity uh, between employees, um, and it's a it's a it's it's going to have an effect on demoralization that it's going to be very hard to recover from, and and it and it erodes the concept of public service, and so if you're a young person today in America thinking about working for the federal government, this is what you're seeing right now. Okay, I'm going to have to look as quickly, Mr. Jarvis. Um, so we've got uh, Acting Secretary Bernhardt doing what we both feel is wrong with uh, the fee collection. Uh, the, um, and so you know, we've got the same thing that will be um, happening in, in the parks, too, with some being paid and some not being paid. But then there's a great concern that I have um, that as we're hiring people using these funds illegally, in my, in the fee collected, in, in my my opinion, to uh, to go to keep these parks open, not open to any kind of standard that I know our park rangers want to see them open on. What's going to happen with um, backlog projects and those employees that we'd be hiring to do backlog projects? Are we not in just creating more unemployment and more backlog by not using uh, these funds in a correct and lawful manner? Uh, exactly. So you're burning through your savings account, the fee accounts, which are know your monies that are specifically and I think legally reserved uh, to address enhancements to the park visitor experience and to uh, the facilities and resources. And um, under normal circumstances, we would be planning for those projects and then hiring employees for the summer uh, to execute on uh, specific projects uh, with the fee accounts. And in this case, it's kind of a double whammy because you're not collecting fees uh, because the parks are open, but there's no fee collection. So you're missing out on $400,000 a day. Uh, so you're not rebuilding the accounts and then you're spending them down at the same time just for basic operations. So really that will have, again, a cascading effect uh, to the experience for the park as well as the resource. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lee. This, this, this shutdown is going to cost us, it's not going to save us any money. It's going to cost 
American Families tragedy, and it's going to cost the federal government more money. With that, I yield back, and thank you so much. Thank you. Congresswoman uh, Howland. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I thank all of you for being here, Mr. Jarvis, Mr. Ash, Mr. Ring, and your dedication to our public lands and everything that you've done throughout your careers. I'm very grateful for that. Uh, my question is for Mr. Jarvis. Uh, I know we're here today to talk about the impact of the shutdown on parks, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the central role of President Trump's ludicrous border wall plays in all the impacts of the shutdown. It's the reason that we're here today. Um, both, those, both those we've heard about today and all those we hear about daily in the news. As a former director of the Park Service, what impacts might a border wall have on wildlife and cultural resources in protected areas along the border? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, you know, as director, I, I visited the border many times. Um, was down in Saguaro or Big Bend or Anza Borrego or any of these places along uh, the area that, um, uh, the, and in the Tahona Odom Indian Reservation and others. And, and wildlife does not um, uh, abide by a boundary. Um, it moves back and forth. Um, and um, creating a physical barrier, as has been uh, proposed by this administration, will absolutely impact. It will bifurcate uh, species, um, in some cases uh, create uh, new threats to endangered species uh, as well. And as you construct it, of course, it's not just the wall, but it's a, it's a road uh, on both sides. Uh, it's access roads, uh, infrastructure uh, for support, uh, all of that. And that can have a significant impact on cultural resources uh, as well, archaeological sites, uh, uh, sacred sites uh, uh, throughout uh, the border area. And in some cases, you know, there, this will be an extraordinary effort to try to build a wall through the the canyons of the Rio Grande, uh, you know, at Big Bend or, or others, where it really isn't quite even possible without doing extraordinary damage to wilderness areas, uh, to wildlife, and to cultural resources. Thank you so much. I yield back. Okay, well, Congresswoman Grijalva. Yeah, I mm -hmm. just thank, thank the witnesses and, and, and thank the, the resource staff and the policy and steering staff for putting this together. Thank you so much. Uh, we have, uh, we're collecting stories and for uh, social media and for dissemination to the public in general and to our colleagues. It's part of the education process. And it's, uh, it's a hashtag, my shutdown stories. We share that. And uh, just to mention that, uh, Ms. Lee, so that uh, anybody listening or watching can access Great. that. Thank you very Great. much. And thank you for holding this. Appreciate it. You'll thank you very much. Let me uh, first uh, thank our panelists. Thank all of you for being here, for really laying out uh, the havoc, quite frankly, that the shutdown is wreaking on uh, Native American communities, Indian land, uh, the, our national parks, our wildlife, it, on the entire country. And so uh, I think your testimony today uh, will be part of the record, and it's extremely important, especially as me someone mentioned earlier, we haven't uh, had our actual first committee hearings yet. And so this is an important um, framework to lay for moving forward. Uh, Congresswoman uh, Grijalva is chair of our National Resources Committee. Congresswoman uh, Betty McCollum is uh, chair of our Appropriations Subcommittee um, that uh, oversees and has jurisdictions over our national parks and over Indian Territory. Let me thank both of you for your um, passion, your commitment, but also for your expertise that you bring to this issues. I mean, you're the right people for the right time as now. And this is really um, important that, um, y you know, your leadership is, is recognized and, and congratulated. And Congresswoman Holland, you and uh, Congresswoman Davids, thank you so much because uh, your uh, historic presence here in, in this house is, is definitely going to change a dynamic that uh, has needed to be changed for so long, and we really value your uh, participation, your leadership, and your presence. So uh, this will be recorded for the record. Um, if you have any additional questions you'd like to ask us, feel free. Uh, and if not, uh, we'll end this hearing, and uh, thank you again. Thank you very much.